Hi there, and welcome to the Third Impact Anime Podcast, where we talk about anime, video games, and conventions, with a healthy amount of existential dread mixed in. You can find out more about our podcast by following us on Twitter, at T-I underscore anime. Or just like us on Facebook to not see our posts, because that's just how it is now. Thanks again for stopping by, and enjoy the show! Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Third Impact Anime Podcast. My name is Austin, the host here, and with me I have the exquisite Bill. Hello. The magnificent Sully. Hi. The fearsome Marissa. Hi. And the ravenous Ryan. Rar. <laughs> uh, how's everybody doing tonight? Good. I'm alright. I apologize in advance, by the way, if I start dying. I'm kind of in the middle of allergies, so I'm coughing a lot. It's all good. We will forgive you. I mean, I'll forgive you. I don't know if the uh, listeners will, but I'll I'll do my best. Okay. Um, but tonight we have all gathered together uh, to do a anime Batman double feature. Uh, we're going to be talking about 2008's Batman Gotham Knight anthology and talking about the very recent uh, 2018 film Batman Ninja, or Ninja Batman, depending on uh, where you are watching it from and what you prefer to call it, but I'm going to go with uh, Batman Ninja. So uh, first off, let's do a little bit of catch-up, and uh, I guess we're going to start with Ryan, because Ryan, we haven't seen you since the Devilman episode. Where you been, my dude? I've been around and finally actually doing busy work for work and literally I haven't not been on call like for a straight week in like three months so I'm very sleepy. So what what exactly do you do and what does it mean to be on call? (laughs) Okay so when I'm on call I work during the week from five to nine after my normal hours to make sure that there are no issues and during which point I'm very busy and can't really do much fun stuff and during the weekends i'm on call friday through sunday which is very very annoying but when i'm not on call i've been uh visiting a certain someone a lot (laughs) so yeah it's not you um yeah so i've been i've been traveling a lot as well as being busy as hell with work but making money so life's good (laughs) You had time to do anything cool, like play video games or watch anything neat? Honestly, not really. I caught up on My Hero Academia finally. Um, I started on Akame uh, HD on my computer recently. Got nice. Donkey Kong Country, which that game is like old school hard, and I love it. And um, Marissa and I have been playing Lego Marvel a lot. Woo-hoo. Oh man, nice. Yeah. Also, I'm offended you did not mention me like making you watch the berserk movies so oh yeah yeah yeah. she made me watch um the first, first two, two berserk movies as well oh and nice uh, made me is very yeah made me is kind of a stretch because i actually really enjoyed them they were um they were a lot of fun and i'd definitely be interested to talk about those in depth later because i have a lot of feelings about them <laughs> good good so so you enjoyed it in in a capacity in which one can enjoy berserk well he hasn't gone yes. into the last movie because it was uh because we saw infinity war for like the second slash third time (laughs) that weekend and i was like i don't want to make you go through infinity war again and then now go through berserk so we're gonna wait until az when i come up we're gonna watch the third movie so let me correct that slightly you were rearing to go on the third movie i was just like (laughs) no i can't (laughs) suffer with me yeah (laughs) ryan i I respect that. Like, that's very fair. Like, I've seen the third Berserk movie twice, and that's twice too many. <laughs> oh, wow. 
It's pretty the rough. First, the first one was pretty light, except for the ending. The second one was not bad. It just had a lot. It, it was very dense. And then uh, the ending was just like, oh, God. But yeah, it's it's a really, really excellent series. Like the story and the characters are all wonderful. But a lot of that comes with some very heart wrenching baggage, as you will uh, as you've already gotten a taste for, but uh, you'll you'll see even more in the future. So I, I'm glad you're getting into it because Berserk's pretty awesome. Yeah, I had I kind of hit my burnout point with anime at some point last year, where I had watched like I think like 30 series back to back, and I just like was like I am done with anime for like a solid while because I was just like it's too much. <laughs> well, hopefully Batman has helped you sort of uh, rekindle your your joy for those Japanese cartoons. Well, I've rekindled it since then, but yeah. <laughs> fair enough, fair More enough. More or less. And Marissa, we haven't seen or talked to you very much lately. You were in the sports episode, which was really great. I enjoyed it a lot. You and Bill did an awesome job, but how have you been lately? Uh, I've been good. Uh, just trying to settle with in with uh, work. We were kind of, we've been down a couple of people, so it's been a little stressful at work. We've merged with another part of the museum and it seems to be working out pretty well. I could actually be on the floor now, which is a lot of fun. So <coughs> you'll come to Discovery Place. I might be doing some of the shows in the next upcoming month or so. It's gonna Ooh. be on the desk. Kind of what fun. exactly what exactly uh, does that mean? I get to mess with liquid nitrogen and make things go boom. So <laughs> Yo. <laughs> yep. Cool. And I haven't really been keeping up with too many series. Uh, I tried starting stuff from the spring uh, lineup, but I didn't really continue on after like maybe the first week or two because of uh, working on panels for Izzy, and then um, a certain someone keeps coming up on most of my weekends. So, Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you are uh, working steadily on the token rambles thing. You want to talk about how that's uh, going? Uh, it's doing really well. We recently incorporated. Alexi into the fold of Token Ramble. She was on one of our uh, regular episodes and then, well, two, a regular episode and then a special extra episode where we reviewed one of the stage plays. But we brought her in and we are trying to get more on a consistent schedule of recording and releasing because I have been a nice slacker on that. So we're trying to release uh, our podcast the first Wednesday of every month. And if there is a stage or a musical, then it'll be like that um, third Wednesday in the month, kind of like that weird in the middle time. So, yep. And we're working, we're going to be recording this weekend the latest musical, and it'll be up this coming Wednesday. So, yep. Cool, cool. I'm looking at, looking forward to uh, listening to it. I, I've listened to some of your episodes, and I'll be honest, like a lot of what you guys talk about just kind of goes right over my head. Like, cause as the just... one who edits it, I un- I completely understand. <laughs> yeah, it, I don't, and I don't it, mean it's mostly as... for fangirls and fanboys. Like, it's it's them just expressing it's... themselves. <laughs> no, it's... and you know that's totally fine. I mean, it's it. I, the only reason it goes over my head is just because I'm not familiar with the source material. But it seems like you guys are really conveying like a lot of passion for that franchise, and that's that's definitely pretty cool. So I'm glad you guys are doing that. All right, Sully, we've we've talked to you recently, but how have you been doing? Because I don't know exactly when this episode is going out, but we recorded the KonMari episode just like two days ago, so I've talked to you plenty, but how are you doing? I mean, don't we talk pretty much every day? <laughs> I, I mean, shut up. <laughs> We're such good friends. Um, so I guess my life has been uh, kind of kicked into high gear right now. I'm a uh, I'm about to start an internship that I'm really excited about. It really kind of matches with my personal interests and uh, started looking for a new apartment and uh, just really kind of moving on into that, you know, crazy thing we call life and only having enough time to sit down and watch Batman Ninja to uh, (laughs) kind of ail it um, and starting getting through a link between worlds. And finally, I, I know I've hit the final point of my my studying for school because I've run out of like things on Netflix to play on like loop. So no more Gretz Co on loop while I'm studying and I have to find something else to listen to in the background. I guess that's going to be uh, a podcast or something. So my media consumption is based on what can I do while also, you know, job hunting or 
or sleeping, which is pretty much my two main modes of operation right now. There's always future funk playlists. That's very true. You know, I don't <laughs> joke. Don't joke. Those things are 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 bopping or slapping or whatever the kids say now. They no, change man, every I, week. I hear you. I hear you. Bill Foreman, how's my boy? Uh, I'm doing pretty well. I guess the one thing I, I, I have to talk about is, of course, it's the spring season, and I've been writing reviews for the new Lupin the Third series that's been airing. And the latest episode that came out, it, it's basically a flashback episode to the Pink Jacket series. Oh, he, wow. was wearing, he was wearing the Pink Jacket. And it had the tone of the Pink Jacket series. And so what I'm thinking is going to happen is they're going to do a set number of arcs. And then in between the arcs, they're going to do what I'm going to call flashback episodes to the prior series with color palette and tone. So it's really just making my fanboy just go squee. (laughs) 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 Oh, very nice. So what would you describe as like the pink jacket tone? Like compared to the other Lupin stuff, uh, very. Do you like Lupin physics? Do you like the absurdity of Lupin? But one that at a higher level, that's the Pink Jacket series. Hmm. I gotcha. Cool. So we can expect some zany stuff coming up from Lupin the Third in the next couple of weeks. Yep. Um, the next arc they're hinting at is they're going to be in Spain. Ooh, very so nice. Pulling okay. off. Pulling off a grand heist with nice. Fujiko finally not being in the background, hopefully. Nice. All right. So um, good to hear you guys are all you know working on stuff. Some of you are working a little bit too hard, but I respect that because real life is important, which is just a really disgusting phrase to have to roll off of my tongue. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um this is an but, anime podcast, sir. Goodbye. Exactly. Like people are here for escapism and Japanese cartoons and all that junk. But, Don't forget uh, to eat and shower, kids. And good advice. Good Castle advice. Mechas. Yes. yes. <laughs> Giant Joker mech. But anyway, we'll get into that in a second. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as I mentioned before, uh, today we're going to be discussing um, the... Uh, 2008 anthology Batman Gotham Knight and the 2018 film Batman Ninja. But before that, um, Sully knows a thing or two about this because he is a, a Batman fan in many ways, as are uh, Ryan and Marissa. And well, we're all Batman fans, but it's more of like a spectrum of our of our Bat fandom. But um, Sully, um, just tell us a little bit about Batman's history in like specifically Japanese media. <laughs> So I guess the real starting point for Batman in Japan starts with the 66 series that we had here and when it was exported there. Um, there was a uh, manga magazine called Shonen King, and what they did is they got a manga artist named Jiro Kawada to do uh, an adaptation of Batman for a weekly publication, and they got it. It was all on the up and up, you know, DC Comics licensed it. And it's very different from uh, the Batman we know. So it's more about uh, none of the traditional rogues gallery show up. It's Batman fighting uh, these very different sort of, uh, they're very Astro boy e style villains. They're very much of that kind of manga period. I think my favorite, who's kind of a fan favorite in general, is Lord Deathman, who runs about in the skeleton costume and cape and his superpower or his motif is that he appears to die, but really he just uses yoga to go into a trance that makes him seem to be dead. And uh, those comics were printed and they lasted as long as the 60s series did. And when that ended, they kind of folded up shop too. And then there was the, um, the uh, book, Bat Manga, that came out like 2008, 2009, somewhere along there. 
And comic book artist Chip Kidd, he was made aware of Batman in Japan. And so he, along with a collector, went and looked for as many extant copies of these original publications they could find. And they translated them and put them in a book with other uh, histories about where you know, where Batman was in Japan. And you have to remember in that time period, a lot of toys were coming out of Japan too. And so they did that. And then luckily DC in America, they got the copyright or the license for the original manga. So they didn't have to use what the collectors had because there, if you look in the Bat manga book, like the book about Batman in Japan, the problem is that like some of the pages have holes in them or they're stained or that they couldn't really didn't have historical copies and now they didn't. So they've published the entirety of the original Japanese Batman manga in three volumes. And they're pretty easy to come across in, you know, Barnes and Nobles, any comic book shop, uh, places where manga is sold. You can find them used pretty easy now. And I definitely recommend people check it out because it's very different. But if you go in knowing how different it is, it's very enjoyable. And it's interesting to see how a different culture takes this very American thing and makes it, uh, so different and still so captivating. And I guess that's something I kind of learned looking at Batman Ninjas, how you have to go in with different expectations. So with anyone who wants to read that, that's my biggest piece of advice. Yeah, I, I've seen the Bat manga around. I, plumb, I thumbed through it one time when I first stumbled across it because I was just like, what? And I didn't actually read into it, though. But my one question about that... Um, does Batman kill? Because I know the Japanese are a little less like reserved when it comes to some of that. And the, I don't know like how well that idea translated at the time that he doesn't kill. That's his line. Did, did Batman kill in the Bat manga at all? Uh, I have to like, I don't remember. I don't think so. And if he did, there's a lot of spacemen. I don't know if they count. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he, he's he's killed spacemen. He like killed slaughter hordes of parademons. Uh, it's it it kind of has that more science fictiony element to it than crime element in in the manga. And I'd say if you want to get kind of a taste of it without reading it, uh, Batman: The Brave and the Bold. Uh, there, I think it was season three. Their last season might have been. I, I forget how many it had. They did a show, like an anthology of Batman, different styles of Batman story, and one of them was an adaptation of one of the Bat manga um, stories, and they do it in that sort of, you know, retro black and white anime style. And I definitely say check that out if you want a kind of a taste of how it how it is. And I love that they even gave Batman his own shonen. 60s Showa era style intro number, like a sort of like Batman Devil Man style number. He flies and fights Batman, purity and virtue, Batman. Cowards run away, Batman saves the day, also for the wonder Robin. Batman and Robin came through Satan's and no. In our last episode, Batman and Robin once again triumphed over their arch enemy, Lord Deathman, after he returned from the grave. But this time, will their most cunning adversary stay buried? Is he still Bruce Wayne? Yes, he's still Bruce Wayne. I mean, that, okay. it's, it's, it's the basic story, and it's not like it necessarily takes place in America. I, it's just like anywhere gotham city anywhere and he talks to scientists a lot and he still has like the detective skills and the deduction and the fighting and he has no superpowers but he does tend to fight uh very like there's dr faceless and lord Deathman, and there's a magician <laughs> and it, it, it's weird it's weird but i don't say that um in a in a in a bad way he fights a gorilla he fights a a guy called Professor Gorilla, <laughs> who was well, literally a gorilla, like gorilla, like gorilla Garod, So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, like, gee, oh, I wonder yeah. what other media that's happened in. <laughs> he even fights one guy who's like supposed to be like this mutated next step in human evolution, and he uh, looks yeah, like, ultra humanite. No, it's he looks he's like a tall creature with with like big ears and have one single antenna like coming out of his forehead and a root on his face and it's oh. 
we it's no it's no like the only characters who are really from the original comics who appear are Batman and Robin. Okay. Everyone else is, you know, Kuwata's OCs basically. Cool. Okay. Awesome. So that basically is the background of uh, of Batman in Japan. Um, but around 2008 or so, which is when the uh, film The Dark Knight came out, uh, there was an anthology project started up by uh, Warner Brothers Animation, um, which would end up being Gotham Knight. And Gotham Knight is a um, about an hour and a 15-minute collection of six uh, short films uh, very similar to projects like Genius Party and The Animatrix and Short Piece and other things like that, um, with these six different um, episodes, if you will, like short segments. shorts, I guess. Yeah, segments, uh, vignettes, it, it, what have you, um, were made by four different anime studios, um, those being Studio 4C, Studio Madhouse, Studio B-Train, and Production IG. Um, all six episodes have very widely different directorial and artistic styles. Um, episodes one and five were created by Studio 4C. Episode two was Production IG. Three was B Train. And four and six uh, were done by Madhouse. So um, I, I saw the first episode of Gotham Knight maybe one or two years ago for the first time and I never actually I never finished it until I was preparing for this podcast. So um for you, I guess Sully and Ryan who watched it probably closer to whenever it came out, what were your first impressions of Gotham Knight? Um like what did you think of it whenever you first saw it? And we'll start with Ryan. Yeah, for me it was kind of funny actually. I didn't actually know about the animated DC like universe and I can touch on that in a minute as well. Um, for like a while, I think the first one I watched in that universe actually was under the Red Hood, and so I I was in I was like a junior in college I think, and I was binging like all of the animated movies that I could find, and then I was going down the list and I was like, oh, Gotham Knight, another Batman story, and was kind of in the kick for uh, another Batman like plot centric movie, which this was not. So my initial thoughts, I actually really didn't like it at all. This was the first PG-13 um, release of a DC film next to uh, Batman Beyond Return of the Joker uncut version, but I don't really count that because that was just something for the fans that they did a lot later after release. And um, yeah, so I, I did like it a lot the second time, though. The different animation styles was definitely a uh, a cool change of pace, and the story was moderately cohesive, I guess. And it was actually... Uh, made to bridge the gap between Batman Begins and Dark Knight, um, except they don't really make that super clear, and also it's not really necessary to know in order to appreciate the story. You can jump in having not seen either of those movies and still like this one. I didn't really pick up on many of the through lines between each of the episodes because I really wasn't looking for them because I knew that they were sort of all supposed to be these little, like, self-contained shorts and i think if you watch them that way then maybe you have a you could have a better appreciation for them um because if you don't then the whole story is just like well where did this character go and like what's batman doing here now and like it, it's very it feels like little scenes of like here's the days and the lives of batman you know what i mean yeah but like the first one it's kind of interesting you mentioned that there were connecting dots but it was like not necessary to connect them. The first one was basically an animated adaptation of Tales of the Dark Knight, which is a story that is told from bystanders' perspectives and, like, hearsay about Batman. Like, I've heard he's a vampire, or I heard he's literally a shadow beast, or, like, stuff like that, like, weird stuff. And, um, yeah, so there was that, and then the guy that he caught in that one, they were taking to... Arkham in the second one, there was the shootout with the mob. Batman went to fight the mob in the third one, and like you know, it went on from there. Like they all, they were all like moderately connected. There's uh, while there is a through line, it's very loose, uh, where you don't really need to pay attention to it if you don't want to. That's kind of how I saw it. Right. But I I really loved the first one and the second one because. The same way in the comics, like if you read books like Gotham Central, which is more focused on 
perspective from the police department, um, the everyday citizens of Gotham City view Batman pretty much as a legend or a myth, where he's not just a man. He could be a beast. He could be some mythical uh, ancient god, like with what he's able to do and these, the rumors that spread around with Batman. And I really love the kind of interpretation that you see from the kid's perspective in the first one, where it's just a bunch of different uh, uh, interpretations of what Batman could be. He could be a vampire. He could just be a shadow that's able to move in and out of light. Um, and I, I just thought that's that's exactly how it is in the comics, and I love that kind of um, more down-to-earth viewpoint of Batman, like where we're seeing what people really think of Batman. So, Bill, had you seen uh, Gotham Knight before preparing for this podcast episode? Not the whole way through, because at first, when I watched it, I I didn't like it because I was expecting more of a complete narrative and not an anthology type um, format. But after watching it for the second time, I really enjoyed it, and I kind of wish that DC, the DC animated movies could do that for lesser known characters that aren't Superman, Justice League, or Batman, because I think that would be a great way to introduce um, kind of unknown characters. I can actually yeah. touch on that. They have done that a little bit. Um, they have, what do they call them? DC showcases. They're like seven to 10 minute shorts focusing on characters that are pretty lesser known. They started off with Catwoman, which, you know, everybody knows Catwoman. Um, they had one for Green Arrow. They had one for Spectre. And they had one for somebody else who was escaping my mind. But I, w- I really wish they would actually go back to doing those because those were a lot of fun and the animation quality of those was really good. Are they as experimental as Gotham Knight or are they more in the line of like sort of the main line DC animated films? Neither. They're like, they're short stories of showcasing the specific hero and it like ties in a bunch of their different things. I think it's mostly just like, entice the people hey you should go read this guy and maybe we'll make a movie about him but um they haven't done them in a while so i'm not exactly sure if they'll ever (laughs) make a green arrow or a specter movie but so they're kind of like little feelers to see if the audience has like an interest in wanting to see more of this particular character yeah pretty much that's cool when you talk about the shorts ryan didn't you um wasn't there one that was like showing batman in the style of like the very first like 39 comic i remember that like vaguely um single. no i'm not sure what you're talking about that might have been from a different series um but i think i have seen the ones you're talking about i know that i've seen the catwoman ones at least and bill when you talk about the the different interpretations of batman it reminds me of the 70s comic they they kind of adapted a few times in the, in the animated series of uh bruce wayne taking these kids out camping and like each of them says like oh my cousin's a thug i know he saw batman he's a monster or oh you know, no, Batman's this super cool, like, modern superhero with a jetpack, or, oh, no, he's this and that, and uh, that's such a common story, but I love it being retold because it really does kind of capture this idea of Batman as a mythos that it really just permeates the American landscape, really. I mean, we were when we were talking about doing this podcast, we were like, should we talk about how we got introduced to Batman? And Austin pointed out, well, we're all born in America. We just know <laughs> who he yeah. is. And there's so many different versions of him, and yet it's so familiar. And I grew I up really, watching animated series. And like that's the thing I really love about like the animated series and like the shorts and Gotham Knight is I'm a big... One of my problems with a lot of superhero things now is everything is so cataclysmic. Like, oh, we have to stop the end of the world, guys, or just the end of civilization. But I really love the like the everyday and the shorts really capture, like, this is what Batman goes through night to night is just another day on the job fighting crime or fighting these villains. And uh, when I was growing up, there was this series of paperback books that were like different different authors writing short stories about Batman. Or I know I love the one that was like just different authors, like short story takes on the Joker and uh, so many of those were. What are these characters doing when they're in their day to day life? What they're what, when they're planning a crime or fighting crime? And those are the kind of stories that uh, I really enjoy. So maybe that's why Gotham Knights short story style, the little like shorts, was so uh, entertaining to me. Is because that's what I like to read about. Yeah, I I get that. And uh, there's a lot of interesting like production pieces on here as well, like. 
Bill, you mentioned that um, uh, the first one, uh, I think you mentioned that it's very, it's done in the similar style as um, uh, the film Tech on Concrete, which is another um, production, or not production, but a Studio 4C film. And uh, the uh, director of that particular short was the same character designer as that film. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh, the last short, uh, number six, uh, Deadshot, which was animated by Studio Madhouse, has a very similar like aesthetic to uh, Redline, which came out just a couple of years, or maybe like even a year after uh, Gotham Knight came out. And it was actually directed, uh, he's uncredited on the disc, but he it was directed by um, a gentleman named Yoshiaki Kawajiri, who people may have heard of for directing a lot of the uh, films and OVAs that sort of set the standard for like weird, dark, violent action anime of the 80s and 90s. Like he directed uh, Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust. He directed Wicked City, Lensman, and he was the creator and director of Ninja Scroll. Uh, so it's kind of kind of amazing that they would bring him in and incorporate him into this Batman project because in some ways like Batman is kind of similar to a lot of those things like very dark very gritty sometimes very violent even though uh, batman does have his like his pop art sort of style and his more cartoony style um but uh it, i think it was really neat to to pull him in who has sort of this like dark big city like uh you know mysterious main protagonist sort of aesthetic and be like like here go do that with batman <laughs> It's kind of interesting you bring that up because uh, the animated series was heavily inspired by Akira, and all of the uh, creators of that were big like uh, underground anime nerds. So Batman and anime have always kind of like flown in and out of each other in terms of like inspiring. So uh, this has always been sort of a give and take. What's interesting to me about Gotham Knight is like up until Ninja, um, everybody considered this to be anime Batman to the point where in Arkham Knight, um, the experimental suit that he was using in the third uh, short, the one that has like the mag the magnet shield that can ricochet bullets, that's a skin in Arkham Knight. Oh, and nice. it's called Anime Batman. And it doesn't even look that anime, except it <laughs> kind of is a little styled. And I'm just thinking now, like, could you imagine if Sengoku Batman was a skin in Arkham Knight now? Oh. I want that so bad. <laughs> like, that Please. is forever going to be the anime Batman. I actually wouldn't even be surprised if people forget that Gotham Knight was the anime <laughs> Batman after this. Whenever Injustice 3 inevitably comes out, I want to see the skins for all of the characters in Batman Ninja appear in that game. Oh, God, please. Hell, it still might happen. They're still putting out DLC for that game, aren't they? Uh, pff, I don't keep up with it, but maybe. Yeah, me neither. I'm waiting for the Ultimate Edition to go on sale, and then I'll buy that one. One other thing I really find cool about Gotham Knight is just the writing staff that's that's involved with all the shorts. Alan Burnett, who was a producer on Batman the... Oh, yeah. I love him. Uh, Greg Rucka, who was a very prominent comic book writer. Brian Azzarello. Uh, there's one other name of note, but they, they really pulled out all the stops when it came to the writing of each of the individual shorts. And the voice cast is also great because they got the definitive voice of Batman, Kevin Conroy, for Gotham. Oh, yeah. And the, uh, this, there's a bunch of prominent voice actors, if you pay attention to that. Like, Kevin Michael Richardson is in it. Uh, David McCullough is the voice of Penny's Worth. Uh, if you would know him from NCIS, and if you're a big UK nut, he's been in a bunch of UK series like The New Avengers and Sapphire and Steel, uh, which is pretty cool. I think I also saw uh, Rob Paulson on the cast, and isn't he Pinky from Pinky and the Brain? Yes. Yep. Rob Paulson like, is a very famous voice actor. Oh yeah, he's in like every Warner Brothers animated thing ever. <laughs> I'm pretty sure yeah. Warner Brothers made him in a test tube specifically <laughs> to be Pinky. And then, like, realized one day, oh, wait, he actually has other use. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah. And Corey Burton, who also does a lot of uh, voice acting at Disney, like, he is the prominent voice actor in the, the, the ghost host in the Haunted Mansion. Ooh. He's also do, does multiple roles in Gotham Knight. As well as uh, Will Friedle. He's, um, he's a Batman Beyond alumni. He voiced Terry. Um, oh, and nice. he, he has a couple minor roles in this one as well. 
So, Bill, I'll ask you this question first, and then Ryan will ask you, and if anybody else wants to answer the question, feel free. Um, but, Bill, if you had to show one, just one of the shorts uh, from uh, Gotham Knight to someone, or would you, which one would you recommend over all of them? Like, this is the one you have to watch. Um, hmm. I think, surprisingly, the one that stuck with me, or maybe not, was the Deadshot one. Mm-hmm. Or, that was that was the Kawajiri one, because it's very it's a very simple but um, exciting plot where uh, I think it's Deathstroke. Yeah, I think it's Deathstroke is um, killing prominent members of the Gotham City population, and the next hit is Commissioner Gordon. So Deadshot, Batman, not Deathstroke. Uh, okay, it was Deadshot? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I know it was Deadshot. <laughs> uh, where Batman has to protect Gordon and figure out where is Deadshot coming from, and there's also a um, pretty cool fight in the subway tunnels that I thought was really cool. Yeah. I'd, ag- I'd agree, either Deadshot or, um, what was it called? I think it was in Darkness Dwells, the first Madhouse one, because mm-hmm. that one... Of all the six, that one bridges the gap between Dark Knight and Batman Begins like very well, but also just it's a very Batman story. Which one is yeah. that one again? It's the one where he's um, going into the tunnels looking for Killer Croc and Scarecrow's involved. Oh, okay, yeah. And yeah, he talks to Gordon and they're like trying to, to figure... rescue that priest. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that one feels like, out of all of them, that one feels most like like an episode of the animated series to me. Yeah, I agree. Um, as for myself, probably the one I would have to recommend the most would be <laughs> would be <laughs> would be the one with uh, be shown in Bruce Wayne and he's golfing. Oh god, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. No, that one's not very good. <laughs> um, but uh, I it would was like light. You got me from. He did. It's so weird, and it's so weird to hear Kevin Conroy's voice coming out of that character. No, I. It, it took me a minute. I turned verse and I was like. That Bruce, because <laughs> he's rather spiky, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, Where, like he normally has like you know the slick pompadour of like a businessman, and I'm like, no, he he's very anime here. <laughs> yeah, and, he's very he's very bishonen. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I really liked the fifth one, the working through pain one, where Batman gets injured and then he goes to uh, India to learn from that uh, guru lady. Um, it's it's not a very quote like like action heavy or like rogues gallery batman action sort of thing it's it's just a very good like little story um that shows it's it's got like a lesson for bruce to learn in that and i think that's a really it's a really good episode it it gives you a different perspective by putting this character that we so often see in like you know the big city metropolis atmosphere and um or not metropolis that's a different city but metropolitan (laughs) you know what i mean Yeah, yeah <laughs> but it's kind like of funny how those him... two words have been like synonymous over the years because of Metropolis. Right, right. But um uh but yeah, just seeing him in that different environment, sort of working his way, like thinking about what he does in different ways. I, I thought that that was really interesting. But uh definitely if you're looking for like cool Batman action, just definitely check out either Deadshot or In Darkness Dwells. Um, the one that you mentioned, Austin, I think the got to me with that one is it's his you see it's his early years where he's trying to train and become better a much better fighter so that way he could become the batman we know today and just the thing at the end where she uh where he goes to protect her but then them out because he didn't learn the lesson he was proactive when what he should have done was just let them do what they wanted to because he could have taken the pain that they, they were going to inflict. And because he wanted to be proactive because he still cannot, he still not finish grieving over his parents. And that's the one thing that he can never let go. Um, no matter how many lives he saved, no matter how many villains he's supported, uh, he is just going to use that to always keep him 
uh, fighting, no matter what. I think my favorite of them is definitely in Darkness Dwells because, as everyone said, it it is it does feel so much like an animated series episode. And um, even though he only appears rather briefly, Scarecrow is one of my favorite rogues gallery villains. So I really enjoyed seeing him uh, in that that design. I love it so much. It's probably my like favorite Scarecrow designs they've ever done, and uh, it's just so moody and atmospheric, and I think it really is just one of those, like, classic Batman sort of stories, Um, and I really love, uh, it's awful, but I do love the the terrible Bruce Wayne Bichon and design in in the field (laughs) test, because when I'm like, it's like Yagami, it's Bruce Wayne, <laughs> and, and we'll get Ryuk to be Alfred, and it'll just be weird. Oh. And, you know, I'll dress up as a bat, and it'll all be part of Keikaku, and uh, <laughs> it's, that's all I can think when I see that design is it's light as Batman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, that threw me off, because I was like, wait, he looks like light, because his hair's a lighter brown and Bruce Wayne usually has that dark brown almost black hair and blue eyes um he doesn't have dark colored eyes it, it threw me off I was like what is going on uh but I'll say my little bit because I'm talked too much because this isn't my expertise my expertise is the next bit um I actually everyone you're all listing all about the same thing uh my favorite actually was the shootout one I think it was called- the second one Yes, yes. Um, the one that, t- it was mostly from the perspective of the two uh, cops taking the guy to Arkham and then getting stuck in a shootout. It's, I liked it because it gave the perspective um, kind of a dissenting opinion from the one cop detective guy and him being rescued by Batman and then just kind of being like, okay, he is necessary and needed for Gotham. And I felt the art style was really nice too even though arkham looked trippy as heck it did I was like, yeah that was like <coughs> it was like arkham city before arkham city mm-hmm. it was it was really weird and i was like that's kind of a weird vibe they're going for but that's whatever <laughs> yeah but the shootout scene with the car and batman swooping in and saving the guy and kind of the trust that the police have with Batman and kind of cool. I like that. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that that's probably all we have to say about uh, Gotham Knight. And I guess now we'll switch gears and we'll talk about the absolute insanity that is Batman Ninja. <laughs> Everyone's been calling me the most powerful man in Japan, the Demon King, Lord Joker. Where am I? But from the look of it, this is ancient Japan. Our master has ordered us to kill him on sight. The Joker. That's right, Max. We'll leave you with us, Master Bruce. They're all trying to take over this country and rewrite history. This is it. The Batmobile, the Batwing, the Batcycle. They've all been destroyed at the hands of the Joker. But I have my mind, my spirit, and all of you. When the country is in chaos, a foreign ninja wearing the mask of a bat will come and restore order to our land. Great Shinobi from across the Sea of Time. Lord Batman. Now what? This one was like... This one was a ride. Like, (laughs) I, I, I loved it. Even as ridiculous as it got, I loved it. So a little bit of the production notes on Batman Ninja before we get into our thoughts about it and exactly how it plays out. So it was directed by a guy named Junpei uh, Mizusaki and was produced by a company called Kamikaze Doga. Uh, Both of those individuals are, or the individual and the studio are probably most known for creating the uh, openings for seasons one through three of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, um, which honestly, at least in my opinion, outside of a show like Land of the Lustrous, for example, 
those JoJo openings, like as short as they are, are some of the best examples of 3D CG anime out there because they're just so fluid and highly detailed. Like they retain all of that detail so well uh, on those 3D models. And I think that in um, in practice in Batman Ninja, it it translates in a very similar way. Like it, the the character designs in that in this movie are very hyper detailed, um, but the animation is still generally pretty excellent across the board uh, when it comes to 3D CG. I'll um, agree with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, we could talk a little bit about that more specifically uh, in a moment, but um, the screenplay was written by the absolutely insane uh, Kazuki Nakashima, who is most known for working with uh, Hiroyuki Imaishi, uh, both in Studio Gainax and in Studio Trigger on both Gurren Lagann and Kill a Kill. He was the main screenplay writer for both of those. And the character designer on this film is Takashi Okazaki who designed the characters for Afro Samurai and is the clothing designer for the upcoming Netflix CG Saint Seiya remake, which I know that Marissa is probably very excited for whenever that comes <laughs> out. Internally screaming. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> whenever I that, the heck that comes out. Yeah, like... Still no release date. Yeah, I was, re- I was reading about it and it said that it had been delayed multiple times and it's supposed to come out next year, so I hope that that is the case. It was supposed to come out at the end of this year, and now oh, it's getting man. pushed to next year. Oof. So it's it's like Kingdom Hearts three; it just keeps getting pushed back. <laughs> Ooh, don't even <laughs> jolly for good that. reason, though. <laughs> yeah. So it'll but take twelve years for it to come out. Pretty much. Uh, let's hope not, because <laughs> Saint Seiya has been the, the past couple of spinoffs for that series have not been the best. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll let Ryan start. So, Batman yeah. Ninja. What did you yeah, think of it? So. As you mentioned, it was written by Kazuki Nakashima, but they basically rewrote his entire script for the English version, so the dub and sub are essentially entirely separate films, which I watched the uh, I watched both of them. I watched the dub and the sub. Both of them are really good. The only thing about the sub is I think it was fan subbed or just like they took the actual translations from the rewrite, uh, which left for some really weird moments when I was watching it. Like, there was no dialogue. Like, it was just ambiance. But there were subtitles, and I was like, wait, is the track messed up? Or are people talking, and they're just way too quiet for me to hear? And no, it's supposed to be ambient, and they, like, just don't talk. But, um... So, um, just to clarify, how did you watch that version initially? Like, what, um, did, what was that on the Blu-ray, or was it on the digital version, or what? I didn't, I, I ripped it from the Blu-ray and I couldn't, I, I couldn't technically figure out how to get it to work for the sub. So I went online and found that and I didn't really feel bad about it because I purchased the thing. I just was having technical issues. So um, that one I watched online and I'm thinking that was just a leaked fan sub that I'm not really sure if it's the official one. So I'll be interested to see once I actually get the Blu-ray working to check that because if they're two basically individual films that's that'll be cool and i noticed there were a couple weird translations of dialogue like uh joker's throwing the fans at him cutting down the trees he's like "Ooh, poison ivy will be mad at you and he's like then stop throwing them at me and he's like but you're (laughs) making me and i was like what (laughs) that's really bad dialogue (laughs) I want to, I mean, I I obviously don't have, like, definitive proof of this or not, but it sounds like probably the version you got, like, accidentally had the dub titles on it when it should have had the subtitles on it. That's what I'm thinking, yeah. Yeah, because I have seen on Twitter, because there has been a little bit of buzz about this, that apparently there is no subtitle, dub title issue on the actual, like, Blu-ray disc itself. So I hope that that's the case. I mean, obviously I haven't checked firsthand, but it, it seems like there's there have been some similar whispers in the wind about things that you have described. Right. But besides that, it it had a really strong voice cast, both in Japanese and English. Um, Batman himself was actually voiced by his Arkham Origins voice actor, Roger Craig Smith, who did a fantastic job in the Origins games, uh, voice matching Kevin Conroy. And he did a great job here, too. He didn't sound as much like, you know, Kevin Conroy in this one, but I don't think he was trying to. Um. Harley's reprised by Tara Strong. Always love hearing her do Harley. And 
Tim, uh, Red Robin, is voiced by uh, Will Friedle. Again, he's a Batman Beyond veteran. He played uh, Terry McGinnis, the Batman of that show. And I love that. That was really cool. Um, it, it was a great movie filled to the brim with historical significance. And I'll let Marissa take uh, take the reins on that in just a minute, because I know she took a lot of notes when we were watching that. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. The only thing, and this is as a fan of the comics, I loved all their designs. Uh, Jason's was weird, but it has historical significance, so I gave it a pass. It does. Yeah. <laughs> I but, want to talk about that. Yeah, it, it was weird, but it, if it's significant, then fine, I give it a pass. But the weirdest thing was that Damien Robin, he was too nice. <laughs> I was expecting the little you-know-what cutthroat idiot that we've come to know from the comics and this would have been a great outlet for him to like cut loose and start you know being damien but he was so nice and i was just like you're not damien who are you and you're too you're too much of a little you know what to have a monkey (laughs) and so that made me yeah it made me laugh but i was just like uh that's not damien but i'll take it (laughs) I mean, this is this is kind of a, a side tangent. I want to get like generally what everybody thought about it, but like at you know, as a filthy casual and as a total like non non carer of such things, I thought that his character within the context of Batman Ninja itself was perfectly passable. But I could understand that like fans that know how that character normally is would be upset. But I think that the characterization that they decided to go with for him within that film, I I found it refreshing because the other Robins were just kind of like stoic. And then the other one was just like, oh, he's kind of the comic relief sort of. I'll I'll agree with that for this context. Yes, I'll completely agree with that. And I wasn't upset. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I agree with Austin. Well, I kind of agree on both terms. Like I was thrown off immediately when Damien came on. He was like, hi everyone and you're like oh my god he's bright and peppy what happened to my uh spawn of satan over here who's mopey as heck um but i agree with you austin they probably definitely did it for uh, production reasons Mm -hmm. um trying to because he is the youngest robin right now he um they're probably trying to get in and be like oh he's a young kid let's kind of play off of that and he has a monkey sidekick because (laughs) plot reasons We'll get into that later. But, we, have uh, have, we have to make a giant monkey mecha. <laughs> that was <Wait>. weird. <laughs> but um, I, most of the other Robins, they didn't really play too much of a role except uh, Red Hood in that one scene. But uh, I will say, even though Tim kind of, I feel Tim always gets shoved to the side when it comes to anything. He's my son. Uh, he made so many snide comments like, uh, what's the point of like when they're running on the field? He's like, what's the point when they're going against the giant mech? And I'm like, my thoughts exactly tim like i lined up a lot with what he said and i found it hilarious he was just he seemed to be the he seemed to be the voice of the audience (laughs) i have to agree with ryan and marissa and i was like he was like i'm damien i'm like are you sure (laughs) (laughs) i mean it was just a very a different sort of character i'm like and why he got the monkey Do, do we really does every kid have to have a monkey sidekick is this batman or is this dunstan checks in like i'm just I don't like monkey, like, side characters. They, monkeys belong in movies when they have wings and they're attacking farm girls. Um, but I'm going to have to respectfully disagree with that. This movie, yeah, this movie renewed my drive to one day have a pet shoulder monkey that goes with me everywhere. <laughs> so it's a, it's okay to have the incorrect opinion. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, definitely this movie... Um, for me, so when I watched it, I kind of half watched the dub the first time around, and I was kind of skeptical because just I've been burned so much by like Batman media just as of late that I wasn't really thrilled. And when I first watched, I disliked it a lot. Like I really was like, oh, I can't. I'm going to be like the one person on this podcast who hates it. And I will say it's very flawed. Um, I think the dialogue. Oh, it's absurd as hell. And I think that's the thing is I was like, oh, the guy who did Kill a Kill wrote this. And then when I watched it again, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go in this with a different mindset. And my mindset was, oh, this is going to be fun. And I think that's what it is. It's fun. And even though there's a lot of moments that make me groan, and I think the dialogue is awful in a lot of places, 
Um, and I think sometimes like the animation goes from really great to really uncanny valley in places. I think even with that, I mean, I give it a like a a, a six out of ten at most, a five out of ten. Like it, it's fun to have and watch, and kind of it's goofy and absurdist. And like I said, I when I figured out the guy who did Kill a Kill Road, I'm like, okay, I get what I'm I'm I know what I'm getting into now. It's going to be loud and crazy and over the top and. I think when I kind of changed how I viewed it, my opinion of it raised significantly. But even then, I mean, just God, every time Poison Ivy and Penguin have their fight and they have dialogue, I'm like, please just stop talking and just fight. Please stop trying <laughs> to make puns. It aren't even puns. Um, and as much as I love Tom Kenny, like he's just, I really miss like the very elegant Paul Williams Penguin voice. And Paul Williams is someone who I guess is now our podcast's unofficial mascot because I bring it up so much. <laughs> but, um, and it was weird because I'm one of those people that's not like a, a Mark Hamill purist. I'm like, yes, other people can play the Joker, believe it or not. It's called acting, but I was not a big fan of uh, – he was too whiny and high-pitched for me. And I say that with a voice that myself is whiny and high-pitched, so uh, glass houses and all that. But <laughs> other than that, other than, you know, Tom Kenny, like I, I do respect his Penguin because I watched the Batman growing up as long, as well as the animated series. So I can respect and I'm kind of ready for like, again, uh, and it's like that in the Japanese version too. It's that kind of clacky Danny DeVito voice. I really want the, uh, the elegant one. And even though I didn't like the Joker voice and for some reason, Batman also looks like Jay Leno. I was uh, after seeing it a second. <laughs> no, look at the scene where he's talking to Catwoman, when him and Selena are talking and he has like his collar up, but not his cowl. He looks like Jay Leno. Oh, you're right. You're right. Yeah. On the topic of the voice of the Joker though, I don't know how many of you have watched Arrested Development, but uh, he's voiced by Buster which kind of throws me because Buster in Arrested Development is a very tame character, and the Joker here was, like, really unhinged. So I was like, well, okay, you are much more talented than I ever gave you credit for. He was also uh, Jeremy Squaller in the new season of Unfortunate Events on Netflix, too, and that's how I know him. Yeah, he wasn't nearly as, like, unhinged as the Joker, though. Is he unrelated to the, Arth- to the Buster of the Arthur cinematic universe? <laughs> Oh my god. Yes. <laughs> oh, unfortunate. <laughs> what I kind of want to bring up is the Japanese voice cast. I actually didn't have time to watch the dub, but the Japanese voice cast was really good. The voice, I think, for Gorilla Grodd was Dio from uh, from JoJo Bizarre Adventure. Yo, uh, the, voice of, the voice of Harley Quinn was Rikigimiya, the queen of Sundere characters. So if you watch, like, Tor. Uh, She's uh, she's in that, and also a lot of One Piece voice actors are were in uh, the movie as well, such as uh, the voice of the Joker was the same voice actor who does Bellamy from One Piece, which I really enjoyed. Uh, so overall, I really enjoyed the Japanese voice cast. I think they had a lot of fun, and I think that's the way you need to go into the movie. It's stupid fun. Oh like, yeah. Don't don't take it seriously. Don't think it's gonna be this grand epic. It's like. Uh, the Dark Knight Returns. Just go in and have stupid fun. I kind of have like a slight thought on that, just like on movies in general. But like people have kind of forgotten how to have fun with movies. They always expect like the next like I don't know Citizen Kane with every movie they go to see. And like I've enjoyed a lot more movies lately when I've just gone in with the intention of just seeing like a dumb movie and having fun. And I think that's exactly what this film is like. I just judging by the premise alone, which uh, we probably should explain at least kind of what the premise is before we get too far into this. And I'll I'll do that in just a moment. Um, But like just just seeing the trailers, knowing who worked on this thing and like just the premise alone of like suddenly Batman and all of his are in like a significant portion of his rogues gallery are suddenly in you know (laughs) ancient japan and then they have this grand battle and everyone is wearing like awesome samurai outfits just like did you expect anything other than stupid fun like this is exactly the kind of movie that is exactly that oh yeah um but in terms of myself like as you guys can probably tell from my inflection and how i've and from what i really enjoy just about like anime in general like I absolutely loved this movie. 
Uh, I watched it in uh, in Japanese, so I haven't seen the dub at all, so I, I can't really speak to that. But kind of like what Bill said, like the Japanese voice cast, you could just tell that they um, had really, you know, they really had an affinity for these characters, and like everyone that delivered their lines really sounded true to form. Like the Joker sounded like absolutely nuts, and Harley sounded like way over the top. And Batman sort of had that, like, even with the Japanese say you had this very, like, Kevin Conroy, like, um, um, I'm Batman. Deep, ex- exactly, that deep, like, <laughs> melancholic delivery. And he's, he was like, you know, but every that's time just that, how I refer to it is the I'm, he has the I'm Batman. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, like, even the Japanese say you had that too. And, like, all, all of the dialogue where the Joker would say something like crazy and funny, Batman would always have like this great sleigh like immediately after. <laughs> uh, like he would he would just own him at, at every turn. And um, uh, this gets a little bit into spoiler territory, but honestly, like we never do spoiler warnings on this podcast, so that's just just what we do. We spoil stuff. Um, but the fact that just so much absurd crap happens in this movie like alfred is suddenly there and like he's got the batmobile and like the joker and gorilla grod have turned these like giant japanese palaces into these like moving ships like mecha style (laughs) things i'm just like this is i am so about all of what this movie is trying to do like it's so stupid and they don't take any time to explain anything and i just don't care because it's <laughs> it's just about this sort of amazing aesthetic over the top action thing where they just tried to cram as much like awesome cool ideas into um you know a, an hour and a half film and i and i think it's just a, an absolute like wonder of just entertainment and like it's it, it was just so much fun. Like I, I want to show this movie to everyone and like no, it's not super smart. There's a lot of things that are really unexplained and a lot of things that are just like why this is so stupid. But I think that's some of the best parts of it is it's just all around stupidity and absurdity and like the giant bat god that is created from a <laughs> giant like tower of both monkeys and bats it's just like of course that doesn't work that way but i don't care it's amazing yeah so it much had anime fun. logic it did and like me being such a big fan of gurren lagan that being like one of my favorite series ever it has so many echoes of of gurren lagan absurdity in it and uh it it just it it wowed me like i really didn't have many expectations but this just really it blew all of my non-existent expectations straight out of the water. And like I was saying, that was uh, when I watched it the second time and I kind of went in with that new look of, okay, I'm not expecting like a great thought provoking, uh, quiet contemplation on yes. If this vigilante was taken into the annals of Japanese history, how would these, like, what would the, no, I was like, okay, so they're just going to wear, you know, you cottons fling bat, shuriken and have fun with it and it was and there are still touches i really enjoyed like i loved like uh if you look on the joker's fans and there's all sorts of lovely uh seals and japanese iconography that have been kind of done in the style of batman logos so like uh, when uh, bruce is disguised as a monk he has the bat symbol carved into his head his <laughs> hair and on his bible that he's carrying and the joker's henchmen all have the squirting flower uh, kind of done in the style of the chrysanthemum on their armor. Um, there's little jesters on the Joker's fans. Like, those are really lovely little touches that I enjoyed, and I, I could kind of latch on to, even though I was like, you know, why why do Mecha Castles? Why, why do that? Why is Alfred here? Um, you know, I love how they're like, oh, well, the, the, the daimyo were tricked. I'm like, they were tricked. Like, what did they, did the clown man just come up and like do a card trick in front of them? And they were just like, okay, you're in charge now. Like, yep. (laughs) Did the penguin just waddle up and like, here's a, I have this bird with me who does not fly. This does not amaze you. I should be in charge. And this is how (laughs) they uprooted the entirety of feudal Japanese society is parlor tricks. (laughs) Oh man. So I, I know, Marissa, you've got you've got a lot of the uh, historical bits that we want to get to. So I'm going to give you your whole section where you can talk about that. Um, but real quick, and I may edit this into the bit uh, like before we actually talk about our thoughts on it. But like, does anyone want to volunteer to like sort of set up the story of what Batman Ninja is about? 
time travel. <laughs> with a few more details, please, there, Ryan. With Batman. <laughs> with okay. a few a few more details there, Ryan. Okay. I, I can... Batman, yeah, let Marissa do it. Okay. okay, go for it. So Gorilla Grodd creates a time machine thing, and it malfunctions thanks to Batman's intervention to stop it. And it sends the entire um, a decent amount of Batman's rogues gallery, along with uh, Batman and all Robins and uh, Alfred as well, uh, to feudal Japan somehow. But uh, and Catwoman that, and Catwoman because she's kind of in his rogues gallery, but not really. That's um, fair. But uh, it's been two years for everyone, and Bruce just arrived into feudal Japan, and so it's him and the Robins and Alfred and Catwoman kind of uh, trying to overthrow the Joker and trying to set everything straight and bringing them back to their time and back to Gotham. Yeah, and then and from there it just it just goes into this just absolutely absurd story about you know how Batman's you know he finds this like bat clan that tells him about this like ancient bat god that's supposed to show up and save them and like it does and it's pretty amazing and then there's just all this just and nonsense. The entire that... <laughs> plot follows the fall of uh, Oda Nobunaga and the unification of Japan. Would you please, Marissa, enlighten us into this very important historical context? Please, you have okay. the floor. All right, so this might hop around a little bit because my notes hopped around because I was adding things while the movie was going. going. But the um, everyone, the Joker, Poison Ivy, Penguin, Two-Face, and Deathstroke have assumed the roles of some of the top warlords during the Sengoku era. Uh, Joker, obviously, is Oda Nobunaga. You can kind of tell, Sully made mention of the really cute, uh, his crest on his fans. It actually is reminiscent. The outer circle is the exact same thing of Oda Nobunaga's Mon. Uh, so then uh, Oda clan is higher style. If you've seen a handful of shows that have Oda Nobunaga in it or characters based off of him, he has that weird ponytail style and his outfit as well is very reminiscent of Nobunaga. Deathstroke is Date Masamune, which is very easy, you can tell, because he has his weird half crescent moon hat like helmet. And also Date Masamune uh wore an eye patch on his eye because he got um an infection when he was young. So it makes sense that Deathstroke would be that character because Deathstroke himself already has an eye patch. Oh, wow. Um yep. Uh Poison Ivy is Uesugi Kenshin. The only thing I could figure out that pointed to it was they mentioned she was ruling over the Ichigo province. Uh, I could I don't know as much about Uesugi Kenshin as I do the other warlords, so I couldn't pick and choose from it. So if anyone wants to ping me on Twitter and kind of have a conversation on that, I would love that. Um, the penguin is Takeda uh, Shingen, who is, it's really hard to, tell but his crest there's when they're showing like the castles being built you see the um it's like four diamonds kind of in making a giant diamond that's his crest and on his helmet on top of it had very small little antlers kind of on the front it wasn't on the sides like the actual warlord and his umbrella is a parallel to uh Takeda his spear, Tomokiri. So, because he has a pokey umbrella. Kind of fun on that bit. Uh, Two Face was Akechi Mitsu uh, Hide. For those of you who know Mitsu Hide, was the man that uh, betrayed Oda Nobunaga in the end and was the cause of his death. And as we saw in the film, if <laughs> the crazy plot that it was, Two Face was aligned with Joker and in the end betrayed him. Uh, he also, his crest on top of his head is the flower that is similar to the to Akechi's family. And also, it's Two-Face. He's a Two-Face person. Hey. Yep. <laughs> um, and Gorilla Grodd is Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who you can tell based off of that weird sunray crest helmet 
thing that he wears later on, and he was actually the man to eventually unify Japan, which is why the mechs unify. Hey. So there's a reason why the mechs actually unify, because he unified oh. all of Japan. Oh. I, I thought about that last night afterwards. I was like, what was the? Oh my gosh. You mean it wasn't? Hit. So there's a DC Megazord? No! It <laughs> was a giant metaphor for him unifying all of Japan. Ah! Tengen so Papa Gorilla Grodd. Yep. <laughs> Um, I'm in Austin. <laughs> so they all represent different warlords that eventually Hideyoshi and subsequently Tokugawa, after where Hideyoshi dies, who takes over, they all helped. Um, they eventually became vassals of Hideyoshi. So, mm-hmm. and and that is why Kazuki Nakashima deserves your worship and respect at every any given moment. <laughs> but uh. <laughs> Other little small tidbits, when it comes to the ninja bit, um, I wasn't as certain. The clan was called, I don't know what it is in the um, the sub, but in the dub, it was called uh, the Hida clan, which could be a reminiscent of the Iga ninja clan, which was one of the biggest ninja clans uh, in Japan, along with the Koga, while Oda Nobunaga hated them because he was constantly being... There was attempts of assassination from them, so he eventually went and wiped them out. What did Joker do? He tried to wipe the ninjas out. <laughs> uh, and they tried to attack him. And most likely, Batman might be, his role might be a reflection, possibly, of Hattori Hanzo. Most people have seen or know of Hattori Hanzo, and he's usually seen as an actual ninja. But in actuality, Hattori Hanzo was more of a general and a tactician, and he um, used the forces of the Iga Ninja clan to fight for Oda Nobunaga in the end when they were trying to unite Japan. So he might be, but I'm not very certain because the whole Bat Ninja monkey thing was a little strange and I couldn't figure out the references to that. There might be references or it could just be um, just the craziness that is um, like Gainax and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, the fact that there's so much significance, though, like regarding that at all, though, is just crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's it's really well put together. Like all the parallels seem like very well mm-hmm. thought out. It and makes a lot of sense. I'm glad though, you were there to like lay that out for me because I would not have seen that. Yeah, a small little. I thought about these two as well because we got uh, Sully mentioned uh, Batman being the Christian missionary, which makes a lot of sense at the mm-hmm. time because he's a western person he's not going to blend in and try to be one with the samurai he's going to look really weird um also Ryan mentioned this when it came to uh red hood's design he was like why does he have that weird hat on him well um komuso monks would wear these um wicker basket hat things on top of them and it was a way of weird it was a buddhist way of kind of like detaching themselves from the the self but ninjas would frequently um uh go around wearing them to obviously to hide their identity so no one would knew what they were so they would just kind of waltz around with these hats on so it made a lot of sense that um red hood who was with the ninja clan at the time would be in disguise Marissa, I love how you say that, you know, of course, Bruce is a Westerner, but not fit in in feudal Japan. And yet the white clown man is completely a normal thing. Because <laughs> he only okay. like, the grinny, ghoulish court jester from okay. future land is going to just, you know, fit right <laughs> into the, you know, Sengoku era. To okay. be fair, the samurai that he sent to assassinate Batman, the masks they were wearing kind of did resemble Oni masks pretty well. It, yeah. it looked like the masks that um, Samurai would wear. Exactly. Places, so, kind of cool. That's one um, thing we can say <laughs> is that uh, being that this the designs and the story are originally a Japanese work, it's done very well. So there's no sort of like awkward, like, I hate using this term, but cultural appropriation. It's very much... Uh, right, Kirk. <laughs> right. So two quick uh, production notes before uh, before we get to our sort of final discussion about uh, about the film. Uh, the music in this uh, film was done by Yugo Kano, 
who also worked as the composer on the uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure TV series, is, which I think really stands out in the sound design during the fights. Um, because if any of you guys have watched any episodes of JoJo, there's a lot of like, like large like hitting and like clapping sounds whenever they hit, whenever they like fight and like punch objects and things like that. Um, especially like when um, Jotaro uses uh, Star Platinum and whatnot with all the punching. Um, and I heard like those same exact uh, like hit sounds uh, in this, especially in some of the scenes where um, specifically Batman and the Joker were fighting. And um, that that particular sound design is is really effective in Jojo. And I think it works very well in this film as well. どうしてジョースターケと he also did the music for uh, Birdie the Mighty Decode from the uh, late 2000s. And probably one of the things that he would be more recognizable for would be doing the, uh, the original soundtrack for both seasons of Psychopaths. And uh, the second production note I wanted to mention is that um, you guys remember like the pastoral scene where uh, the Joker and Harley are like living as farmers and then the Red Hood shows up? Yes. So uh, that particular scene was directed by a, a different director than the rest of the film. And you can kind of tell visually for sure because it got a totally different style. Uh, that was directed by a guy named uh, Takuji Miyamoto, who is a fairly young animator. Like he really hasn't done very much. Um, his sort of claim to fame is that he worked on the uh, finale episodes of uh, Mob Psycho 100. So like all of the weird, like uh, sort of ex like surreal experimental looking like shots and things in those uh, episodes of Mob Psycho. And if you guys that have seen it, you know, like that, that show gets pretty weird visually. So he, he was uh, a key animator on that. And he also did some uh, work on Space Dandy as well. Um, so I would definitely try and keep him on your radar, like just looking at some of his body of work. Um, he's got a really interesting style and you guys can speak to uh, that particular sequence in Batman Ninja as well. It's it's definitely very unique. It's not a style you normally see in anime. So I, I would definitely keep that guy on your on your radar and uh, see what he does in the future. Yeah, mentioning Mob Psycho, I can totally see the connection. Yeah, for sure. Definitely a lot of similarities there. But I guess in closing, when we're talking about uh, Batman, um, I just want to know, like, what specific scenes really stood out to you guys? Or, like, if you had to pick a favorite scene or a favorite sequence, like, what do you think it would be? And I'll, I'll start with you, Bill, since you're the first on the Discord list. Uh, my favorite scene probably has to be when all the monkeys come charging out <laughs> to go deal with the giant <clears throat> neck. And that the monkeys and the bats merge to form this <laughs> giant Power Rangers Super Sentai type robot uh, in design, and it just it just reminds me of something I'd I've seen in uh, cartoons before. I've just like I've, I think I've seen it in like Kids Next Door. I think I saw it in Dexter's Laboratory. If anyone remembers that, and it just it's so absurd. That, but it's just so fun. And also, solely to go against your point, monkeys have always been a part of anime. Have you not watched Speed Racer? <laughs> <laughs> He's got you there. Or Dragon Ball. <laughs> that too. But yeah, just that whole sequence with the monkeys and the bats trying to fight the mech robot and <laughs> resisting against the flames. That was probably my favorite part. Look, I'm not against all monkeys. I just don't like <laughs> monkey sidekicks for small children. They annoy me. I mean That's the small children, not the monkeys, but those two. That's an important caveat to mention. It was very much so. <laughs> Ryan, what was your favorite scene and or sequence? Probably the boat fight, because we got to see 
uh, the Bat Family working together, and I love every single member of the Bat Family. And they were they were all fantastic, as well as the final fight. I wasn't a huge fan of the mech battle, per se, because I felt like it was kind of out of place from the rest of the movie. But when they were on top, like, fighting each of the lords inside of the mechs and Batman and Joker fighting on top, I loved that sequence as well. Like, I'm a huge sucker for, like, well-animated fight scenes. Mm-hmm. And for you, Marissa? Um, I'd have to say, I can't think of what my favorite scene would be. Um, I'd have to say like the boat scene as well because that's where like everything came to a head and you saw the like the quote unquote death of Joker and or the death of Uru Nobunaga and all of the Robins fighting, which was really kind of cool to see everyone come together with that and the ninjas tricking everyone with the fake ninja dummies and they're actually like on top of the ship, but uh a kind of going off of that scene because you see Joker blowing him, himself and Harley Quinn up, which is reminiscent of the uh, Honoji incident where Nobunaga was betrayed by Mitsuhide in his face, tooth face. Uh, and Mitsuhide actually ultimately eventually dies in the end because Hideyoshi kills him. Um, but Nobunaga, they never actually found his body in the fire. So a lot of people speculate that he, everyone, there's like conspiracy theories that Oda Nobunaga could have actually lived out his life afterwards. So that's why we might have had that weird scene with um, him and Harley living their days out because it could have been like, oh, oh, that's Oda Nobunaga living days out. But it was like, nah, that was a plot reason. <laughs> like, could have been both. Could have been both. Yeah. Sully, what was your favorite sequence? It's such a very minor scene, but the thing that just is my favorite part of this movie is when uh, Batman is, you know, coming to head-on collision at his castle, and Harley Quinn has the little cutout Batmobile, and the two servants are scrolling the map as fast as they can to make it seem like it's an in-real-time, like... <laughs> computerized yes. map. That's my absolute favorite moment, and it's the tiniest moment, but it's my favorite. Yeah, that if was I, great. That was If I had great. to pick something other than that, I would say um, probably the scene on the boat, like others have mentioned, where uh, they have the, the first real like big fight with the Joker. I love that uh, Harley's hammer is replaced with a Tygo drum, and we yeah. can see that here. I thought that was incredibly clever. But those two are definitely my favorite, and I, I just, when I saw the the scroll scene, I just died laughing, because that is <laughs> such a Joker thing, is watching it and being like, yes, this makes perfect sense, even though it does not. <laughs> yeah. So I have a couple serious ones and a couple of hilarious ones. So obviously, right. you guys know that, you know, I'm all about them them giant robots, so obviously, like... Just the realization that knowing that there was going to be a giant mecha combination thing, just it it was basically pumping adrenaline straight into my brain. Like that was just I'm all about that sort of thing. And just just knowing the the lineage of Gurren Lagan and seeing that like permeate this piece, I'm just like, of course all of the villains would combine into a giant mech, and that just makes <laughs> me so happy. I love that. I also thought it was really cool how Gorilla Grodd was like using the uh, the shogi board to like control everyone's mind. I thought that was really clever and cool. Um, and then uh, I guess a smaller like hilarious scene i i liked the after credit scene whenever like batman and alfred are back in gotham and like for no reason batman rolls out of the bat cave or whatever with this like japanese horse-drawn carriage thing and i'm just like ah yes bruce has returned to be an absolute japanophile <laughs> i also was just like for that scene because it wasn't just a car it was like a horse-drawn Batmobile. And I was yeah. like, hey Bruce, you have a secret identity to protect, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and he just they just smack that Joker painted up car like it's not even there. And it was just like makes that awful like car hitting noise. I thought that was so funny. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, does anyone have any closing thoughts in general about Batman Ninja? 
I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I want them to do more stuff like this where they just throw out the seriousness of Batman every once in a while and just have fun and make it like honestly as well put together as this was like it was ridiculous as hell but it was really well thought out like all the little plot elements you could think of like oh that's a plot hole no they actually kind of did a really good job of tying up loose ends what i really loved about this story is it reminded me of a really good else comic which if you don't know what else world comics are or uh dc comic books with their superheroes primarily batman and superman in uh non-continuity storylines and so this makes me think i would love to see them adapt more of those kind of elseworld stories like superman red sun where superman lands in the soviet union instead of uh smallville and i i think just doing kind of more absurd kind of more interesting settings would be uh more engaging because while i like the dc animated universe that they've been doing with like batman and son uh and uh a couple of the other ones they feel sometimes a bit samey so by kind of doing batman ninja i think that kind of changes it up and makes it a little bit more interesting you've heard oh. of you've heard of superman red sun now get ready for superman rising sun oh my god <laughs> nice. that actually works too a <laughs> Also, a little side comment. I love that Damien's monkey had a girlfriend monkey <laughs> that before they left to go back to um, the present day, the monkey is like, well, I would go with you, but my lady's here, so I have to stay with my lady. <laughs> I loved so his monkey so much. His monkey was amazing. And also, we didn't mention this, but when they were, Grodd gave them a flute to control the monkey army and Damien and his pet monkey were playing it like Damien was blowing and the monkey was doing the hand bits. It was playing the 60s Batman theme. Oh, wow. I didn't even notice that. It it was very subtle, but like, yeah, if you listen, you can hear it. Also, we can't, right before we end, we cannot, you know, end this podcast without mentioning the fact that we got a Gorilla Grodd Hot Springs episode. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we I don't did. like you anymore, oh and I gosh. refuse to be on this podcast. <laughs> That's fair. We've lost Sully forever. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that <laughs> it just had All so right. many like weird little anime references. If you like, think deep about it. Yeah, Alfred was definitely uh, the most moe character. That's for sure. Oh my. So it has been wonderful to have you all on here to talk about these two wonderful uh, Batman anime things. And uh, real quick, we know this episode's gone a little bit long, but we had a lot to cover. Uh, We did have some Twitter questions uh, from the Immaculate Basil down in Huntsville, Alabama, who we will be visiting very soon, coming up this summer, uh, visiting the convention Hamacon down there, where we are uh, designated panelist guests. And we are very honored and very excited to go down there and, uh, you know, spread some uh, pretty decent panel qual- uh, panel content to the uh, wonderful folks down in Alabama. So Basil asks us a 22 uh, different Twitter questions. <laughs> um, most of them are very, very quick. So I'm going to I'm going to go down the discord list and everyone can take one unless I unless there's one that I think is like specifically uh, targeted at one of us. All right. So we'll, we'll start with Bill and then go Bill, Ryan, Marissa, Sully. All right. And then me. Sounds good. All right. And try and make these answers quick because we got a lot of them. All right. Bill, why ninja? Because super fast speed and reflexes. All right. Ryan, why now? Because it came out yesterday. Marissa, who is best ninja? Tim. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's gonna be Red Robin. <laughs> All right, flip Sully. Line. Sully, who performs the best flip kicks? Uh, 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 pass. Nightwing. Uh, okay, I was gonna say Catwoman, but all right, Nightwing. <laughs> all right, are there flip kicks, Ryan? Yes. Okay, I'm just kidding. I skipped over Bill. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> you skipped over yourself too. <laughs> that's true. Well, I took it for Catwoman. Yeah, Catwoman. Um. All right, does Batman fight ninja robots, Bill? No. Ryan, does he fight alien princesses? 
No, but I'm going to actually amend Bill's statement and says he fights a giant ninja robot. <laughs> Bill, who is your favorite color jacket Lupin? Uh, oh, I, I guess I'm going to have to go with green jacket. Marissa, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? Mint chocolate chip. Sully, does anyone Naruto run in this movie? Thank God they don't. <laughs> Austin, yeah, they actually don't. <laughs> Austin, self, does Naruto make an appearance? No, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, Bill, since Naruto doesn't make an appearance, what's up with that? Um, I guess they just didn't pay him enough to show up. There is no question 13. Let's go to 14. All right. Marissa, or no, Ryan, I'm sorry. <laughs> is Batman <laughs> is Batman Hokage in the end? Pretty much. All right. Marissa, does Batman play Crash Bandicoot at any point during this film? Uh, no. Okay, I don't think any of us have seen these two movies, but how does this compare to Black Lion or Dagger of Kamui? Since I haven't seen them, I'm going to say it's way better than both of those. Yup. All right. <laughs> uh, Sully, uh, why did I forget question 13? Who the hell wrote these? <laughs> <laughs> because it's an unlucky number. Question for me. If I had a question 13, what would it be? Um, oh, where's gosh. My, where's my pirate-themed Batman show, and where's, <laughs> where's Luffy? Is That's mayonnaise that- an anime? <laughs> Perfect. Those are both good question 13s. All right, Bill. Which deck should I be playing in Hearthstone? <laughs> um, I guess right now it would either be Even Paladin or, or Tom Druid or any Warlock deck. <laughs> All right, Marissa already answered this, but is Joker pretty much just Oda Nobunaga? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, question for the group. How excited are you for Hamacon? Me, very excited. Me, unfortunately, I can't go because work stuff, but I wish I could. Are any of the rest of you guys going? Nope. No. Oh, man. No, <laughs> it just happened to work out that... Uh, the just just me is the only one on this on this pod that's going but tobias will be there tori will be there i think andrew's gonna come as well so there will be a lot of us and question 22 is please take this time to talk about hamacon all right so like i said earlier uh hamacon is a uh, anime convention in huntsville alabama um it is a three-day event um we we will be there for all three days um we're very excited to go down there and do a whole bunch of panels uh there's gonna be uh lots of the same sort of things you can expect to see at pretty much any panel or any uh convention rather um there's gonna be artists and dealers and guests and all that awesome stuff uh some of the premier guests for hamacon this year apart from third impact anime uh which is what everyone is obviously going to be there for um we've got erica harlicker she's a voice acting guest she's going to be there she plays on in persona 5 She's also uh, Jean in um, Fate Apocrypha, and she's in a whole bunch of other things, and she's just an all-around good egg. I follow her on Twitter, and she always posts a lot of cool things about mostly Kingdom Hearts, actually. She's a big Kingdom Hearts fan. Um, And then we've got uh, Austin Tyndall, who is another voice actor. He plays Kaneki in Tokyo Ghoul, among other things. And then we've got uh, Marianne Miller, who plays Amanda in um, Little Witch Academia. Got I hope she on. brings her husband with her. Yeah, I hope so too, because she is married to um, a little Karibo, uh, who everyone should know is basically an internet legend at this point. He's yeah. the, ma- the mastermind behind um, Yu Gi Oh! The Abridged series. And uh, a couple other um, like cosplay guests and a couple musical guests. So uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm very excited for Hamacon. And uh, yeah, thanks, thanks again, Basil, for uh, submitting all those. Uh, innumerable questions, and I hope we answered them to your liking. I think also, I have one question from uh, my gaming crew. I asked them for questions just before we started the podcast, and as Edwin asked me, is this today? So the answer is yes, this is today, Edwin. Yeah, it, you know, Edwin always asks so many good, astute questions. It's it's really great to have him as a, as a consistent listener, so shout out to you, Edwin. Yeah. Really deep <laughs> questions. For sure. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, again, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you all about uh, Anime Batman. And Bill, where can people talk to you on Twitter? Um, you can find me at WBForman999 on Twitter. Uh, quick shout-outs to the website. 
www.thirdimpact.wordpress.com. You should be seeing my weekly blooping reviews on the site. Uh, you're going to be seeing something about the Pink Jacket episode pro- probably pretty soon, and a review about the new Full Metal Panic series that is going on currently this spring season. And just to clarify, it is thirdimpactanime.wordpress.com. Oh, I just, uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, I, guess, I guess because I've said it so many times, uh, this is the one time I just had a, my brain said, no, it's this way. <laughs> Let Get me make this- it easier. Link below. Yeah, yeah, that'll work. It's it's in the show notes. Get this man a script. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ryan, where can people talk to you on the internet? They can't. All right. Well, yeah, uh, follow so me on Twitch. Stuff. I've been starting to stream a little bit more lately at um one RDM gamer. Um I don't really use my Twitter anymore, but it's at Ryan McEntee. Um link it below. But yeah, it's boring. I made it when I was forced to. Uh but what do you what are you streaming on Twitch these days? Um, pretty much anything related to what Edwin, Will, myself are recording, where we started up a gaming show that is currently unnamed, but once it is named, I will let you know. Yes, please do. And Marissa, where can people talk to you about Token Rambu, and where can they find your podcast? Um, you can find me on Twitter at Muse0Ica, so the M-U-S-E, the number zero, I-C-A, um... And you can also find Token Rambles at uh, Token Rambles Pod. I believe our Twitter is just Token Rambles, but you can find everything else um, on Token Rambles Podcast, um, be it our Facebook page or our Podbean. And we're actually setting up our Discord to be more of a uh, community to get more people to chat with us and get involved a little bit because I know. Uh, there's a handful of people that probably want to talk more about Token Rambu. You know, there is a uh, wonderful Discord for the Token Rambu wiki that's pretty active, but um, it'll be more about with us on there. So, yep. I hope cool. That's everything. Sounds great. And, and look Sully. out for our. Oh. oh, no, go ahead. I was going to say, look out for our um, review of Suo Monodomo. Something, whatever. It's a really long title. Uh, the fourth musical, it'll be posted this Wednesday. It'll be a long one. I need to watch awesome. it. Awesome. And Sully, where can people talk to you on the internet? Uh, pretty much the only place you can contact me right now is on Twitter, at Calvacun. And uh, that also has a link below because I get tired of spelling it out every week. Um, <laughs> and that's pretty much it because I'm a private person. I don't want people to bother me unless it's very vitally important. So it must be about anime or Batman or uh, the, the nature of the universe. I don't know. Something that's life or death like that. What if somebody something. wants to give you money? No one would ever want to give me money. <laughs> pa- Patreon.com. <laughs> Patreon.com slash Sully. <laughs> no, and, the Sully. Uh, the Sully. And as for myself, you can find me on Twitter at Bebop Shock, and that's Bebop as in Cowboy Bebop, and that's Shock as in Bioshock. And uh, something that Tobias and I have tried to be tried to do a little bit more lately is host uh, rabbit streams for watching some uh, anime on like Crunchyroll or Verve and stuff like that. Um, and uh, that's how we watched Batman Ninja together uh, last night. Um, so whenever we get those streams queued up, we don't have really a set time that we do it. We just do it like maybe one or two nights throughout the week. And, um, sometimes we'll, uh, throw up that link to our rabbit account up on either Twitter or Facebook and feel free to pop on in and, uh, and chat with us and watch some cool anime. So, um, all right. So I guess that's the end of our episode and thank you so much for listening. And, uh, we hope that you'll join us again for the next one. Woohoo!